I am uh, very honored to kick off the, kick off the quarter. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today, or getting to eventually, um, is the idea, is that kind of a proposal for a system um, that would help people talk about and converse about and disclose um, flaws in the published research record. Um, just to start off with some groundbreaking news I know will shock you. Um, there have been millions of academic papers published. Some of them are not correct. Okay. So the question is, how do we do things, sorry? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I hope not, but everything's probabilistic. Um, the, our goal, sort of broadly speaking, right, is we want like more of these papers to be correct and fewer of them to be incorrect. Um, so we can actually learn things as scientists and as like consumers of research and the public um, that are accurate. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today um, just is first to give some background about what's, what I really call like a crisis of credibility um, in empirical social science right now. Um, some of you might have heard a lot about this. Some of you might have heard almost nothing about it. So I'm going to kind of talk about this, tell like how it works, why is it that social science is in such bad shape right now. Um, in my opinion, anyway. Um, I'm going to talk about some existing efforts that are really great that are trying to address um, some of the problems I'm going to talk about. Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk about kind of a proposed additional effort that I don't think will solve all problems, but I think might help solve some problems um, that kind of plague the status quo um, right now. And I think it can help accomplish that goal of more research is correct, uh, less research is incorrect. So, uh, and in there will be a um, thrilling personal story, uh, <laughs> uh, of a sort anyway, uh, that, uh, that you mentioned. So first, um, I think the title of this really famous paper, this is from 2005, um, really kind of summarizes uh, basically the state of the world we're in right now uh, pretty accurately. Um, it's not just like some academic papers are false. Um, it is probably actually the case that a majority of academic papers are false. Um, this is bad. Um, our, our job is not to be this way. Um, we want to produce research um, that is correct. And, there's, and I'm going to talk in a second about why this is, um, but um, this original paper in 2005 just did some basically careful math trying to understand, okay, based on the way that we know scientists do their work um, and the way we know publishing works, which I'll get into in a second, um, what percent of papers are, are probably correct? And the answer it arrived is, is most are not. Um, recently, um, this was just a few months ago, there was this really ambitious effort uh, by um, some folks at a, a, a nonprofit called the Open Science Collaboration based in the university uh, or around the University of Virginia and kind of science labs, uh, psychology labs across the country where they tried to kind of evaluate this claim empirically. And they said, okay, let's go to some really um, prominent psychology journals, the journals that like important findings that have a lot of credibility associated with them. Let's go read 100 psychology studies and then just replicate them exactly. So you read a study and it says, if you show people the color red, um, then they you know, are more likely to use this word or something. Or if you um, talk to people in a certain way about, let's say, another group, they'll be less prejudiced towards that group. Um, and so they said, let's just do exactly what these people did to see if the discovery they supposedly made or their theory is, is actually right. Um, just doing exactly what they did, replication. Um, what they found when they just did the exact same studies that are in these prestigious journals, is that most of the time, um, they could not actually replicate those studies. Um, so consistent with this, um, uh, these theories from about 10 years ago, it actually does seem like in social science journals right now, um, probably most of what we read um, is not true. Um, so I would say this is about as worse, like we can't really be failing any more than this. Um, and so like, why is this the case? Why are we failing? So there's this really great, uh, I think it's like two or three page um, little semi-satirical paper by this um, anonymous skept uh, kind of critic of science. Yeah. Psychology journals and stuff like that. Is there a possibility that the scenario is different because different communities may respond differently to the same, uh, to the exact same experiment? And so yes, that's definitely possible. So they, they talk about this in the paper. It's possible that there's a lot of reasons why something might not replicate. It might not be true. It might not just like not be very generalizable. That's right. Um, so that I would definitely put under the heading of like you know in some sense. Um, it's, uh, you know, it depends on the, the question you're trying to answer. Is it like, is the original paper wrong or is it just like not very useful in some other circumstances? We can't be sure. Um, but that's kind of the evidence we have right now in any case. So um, some reasons why um, that might be the case, why it is that we might not be very good at producing accurate knowledge um, are summarized in this very humorous uh, pyramid um, inspired by Dante's Inferno. 
um, by this uh, anonymous critic of science, neuroskeptic. He calls the nine circles of scientific hell. And this is kind of a chronicle of some of the practices that, that lead to this state of affairs. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple um, of them in detail. Um, the first is something that has gotten a lot of, of um, uh, uh, a lot of coverage recently, and this is the idea of what's called uh, p-value phishing or uh, p-hacking. Um, and, and here's how this works. Uh, when you do, for those of you who have not done a kind of empirical social science study, when you do a study, quite often what you do is you say, okay, I have some theory about the world, and let's say I have this pill that's going to reduce blood pressure, and I gave, I did an experiment, I gave Let's say this half of the room is randomly seated on this half. You guys get the blood pressure medicine. You guys get the sugar pill. And now I'm going to measure your blood pressure and say, hey, it turns out the people that I gave the blood pressure medicine to um, had slightly lower blood pressure. This is success. OK, well, how do I know, you know there's a 50-50 chance that one half of the room is going to have lower blood pressure than another. How do I know? that really this side of the room has such lower blood pressure, it's really unlikely that I just happen to put the low pr blood pressure people on this side. Well, we got this thing called a p-value, uh, which is rigorously stated the probability that if this blood pressure medicine didn't work, your blood pressure really would be as low as it is. So the idea is I say, if you're a skeptic, you say, there's no way your pill works. I say, well, if you are right, there's only a 1% chance that this side of the room, if we just randomly sorted people, we'd get people on this side of the room that have such lower blood pressure than this side. So that's a p-value. I'd say that's a p-value of 0.01. And in the world of academia, um, generally speaking, the threshold we use for kind of over the bar, a finding that is worthy of note, um, is a p-value of 0.05. It doesn't mean something is true if the p-value is below 0.05. It just means it's kind of clear to this arbitrary bar of this, this is the kind of evidence that a skeptic of your theory would not expect to see. The problem is, and if you think about this, imagine a world, and I'm going to explain this graphic as I go. This is from a paper um, by uh, some uh, Simons and Nelson and Simmons in 2013, they have this idea where they say, well, you know, we, we see that what a lot of people are doing is they say, well, I know my colleagues, if I want to publish a paper, get a line on my CV, I know my colleagues want to see a p-value below 0.05. That's the bar. And let's say I did this blood pressure study. I put you guys over here and you over here, and the p-value is like 0.06. I say, man, you know, that's not enough in the academic court of opinion to get my CV line, which I need. So what am I going to do? Um, well, what I'm going to do, um, and what they show a lot of people seem to be doing, is they say, well, you know, maybe this blood pressure medicine doesn't work for everybody. Uh, but maybe it works for, let's say, people under 30. And so I look at just the people under 30. OK, no, like the p-value there's like 0.2. I so, say, OK, well, maybe it works like just for men. OK, no, it doesn't work for men, but for women. And you see people looking. You say, well, there was this one person who I know didn't really take their medicine. And you like look at the data a lot of different ways. And finally, you find a way. You look at the data, and the p-value is like 0.04. You say, aha, oh, of course. That's, I mean, all along. I thought that if we just look at men under 30, we would see this effect. And indeed, when we look at that subgroup, there's an effect. And then you have a paper, pill reduces blood pressure for men under 30. OK, so um, this is the kind of thing that people suspected was going on, um, that you can kind of keep looking in the data until you get that significant effect, um, which is troublesome, I should say, because even if your blood pressure medicine works for nobody, if you just keep on cutting the data in a lot of ways, you're going to eventually find something like that. So what they said is, well, you know, it's hard to, in any particular case, know this is going on. But at the level of the entire community, you can actually get some sense of it. And they found some pretty disturbing evidence of exactly this. So on this graph, what you're seeing on the red line is, imagine that if we have these p-values, if, if imagine that experiment I just described, this blood pressure medicine that doesn't work, is done like 10,000 times in every university in the country. And then we just collect all the p-values from all those honest experiments. Um, if that blood pressure medicine doesn't, doesn't work, what we're going to see is basically, because it's a probability, just uniform distribution where just as many p-values at 0 at 0.01, basically 5% of the p-values will be below 0.05, 4% will be below, below 0.04, et cetera, just uniform distribution. On the other hand, suppose that this medicine actually does work. Not everyone's going to find that magic below 0.05, but more people are going to find more, lower p-values. So that's that line in green. So basically, if we have some chance, if the kind of effect is real, uh, and we have some chance of detecting it, you're going to see more p-values kind of sort skewing such that there's more closer to zero. But instead, when you look at a lot of literatures in psychology and even in medicine, what you find is the opposite, which makes no sense statistically. Um, and one of the only ways you can get it is if researchers are doing what I just described. If they say, well, 
I have this data, and I'm just going to kind of like keep on looking at it in different ways. And as soon as I manage to find a comparison that just ekes over that threshold below 0.05, I'm going to say, aha, that's my paper, and then write a paper around that. And when you collect all the p-values, um, and this, I think I forget which this was they had on their blog, uh, Data Collada, you see, um, you, see, you see evidence like this. Yeah? So just to make sure I understand, this is all making an assumption that there's that the null hypothesis is true and there's no effect, right? Exactly. So would this still be the case if people, if their or, insight were accurate and they were actually pursuing things that did have an effect? Sorry, so yeah, so, um, so let me rephrase that. So the red line is, if the null hypothesis is true, that is to say medicine doesn't work, that's what the p-values would look like, uniform distribution. If the null hypothesis is false and there is some effect, then you see the green. And so really what we should see in the worst case is that kind of flat. And, and kind of as we start to study true things, we should start to see lo uh, more lower p-values. Um, but like what we see is the opposite of what you see, like which like makes no sense unless researchers are doing this, what they call kind of p-hacking. And what's in blue is actually like an empirical observed kind of p-curve, they call it, in some academic literature. So, um, so, so that's not good. Um, so another, this is a, a recent study by um, one of my colleagues in the political economy group. So he looked at this kind of, just where you can sort of see this even happening more directly. So what they did is they said, you know, there's this cool competitive grant competition in psychology. There's one in political science too, where what you can do is say, I have this idea for these experiments that can be done in Mechanical Turk. You have people some, read some text, say if it changes their attitude, say. And what people would do is say, well, here's my idea for an experiment. I'm going to show people, let's say, one of five different stories, and then ask them questions about that story. Did you find it persuasive? Did you like it? Whatever else, let's say. A really boring study like that. Um, and then, um, then they say, when they send in the proposal, like, here's what it is we're going to do. Here's what it is we want to test. And in order to like, get the money for the proposal, you have to like, actually say what it is you want to do with the data. Um, and in this particular case, how it worked is that the people actually, when, when you kind of win the proposal, this group actually does the research for you. So when you win, they say, we're going to go run your questions on our pool of subjects um, and run your experiment for you, give you back the data, and then you get to go publish it. Pretty good, right? Well, that also means is that these authors might, um, they, uh, working with the people who ran this repository, uh, uh, Neil and his co-authors could go back and say, well, let's look at these original plans researchers had. And how often do they actually follow what they said? Oh, I'm going to look at, say, if people like story A better than story B, um, and that's, that's my hypothesis. And what they find is that when you look in the papers, um, it looks pretty different than what people said they originally intended, kind of consistent with that story of after the fact looking for the kind of good looking results. So you find that um, when you look at all the tests that are not reported, that people planned they said to do, um, those usually are not significant. They don't meet that magic 0.05 threshold. But there's other ways of looking at the data, like, well, if we look at this other question that I asked, and I look at this other group, then I do see something, and that's what makes it into the final paper. And so you can actually see individual studies doing this um, systematically. So this is kind of a problem. Um, if, you're, if you're already depressed, I'm going to make you a little more depressed. So this sort of is sort of dishonest in some way at the level of individuals. So we say, oh, all along I thought this. Um, now, imagine that everybody actually is honest. Um, we're just lazy. Um, that's what the next, um, th the next uh, issue is about. This is called partial publication. So the idea here is, um, imagine that, again, there's those 10,000 universities around the country all doing um, their experiment. They all split the room in half, give half the people blood pressure, blood pressure medicine, half don't. As I said, 5% are going to come up with the magic answer that this, in fact, does reduce blood pressure, uh, even if it doesn't. Okay, so we're going to have these hundreds of people across the country who find this result, even though the vast majority of people are going to get the truth and say, no, this probably doesn't work. Well, how academic publishing works is when you have a crazy idea and it's wrong, then you know, that happens all the time. You sort of move on to the next project. So all the people who they had this blood pressure medicine, they gave it to this side of the room, didn't do any better. Oh, well, lots of things don't reduce blood pressure. Let's move on. But for the 5% of people that erroneously found that it did work, those people are going to say, wow, I found something really cool, and I want to go publish it. And so as a reader, as someone looking at academic journals, the only things people bother to write up and send in and that get published are the things that report a crazy idea that's true. And all in, when those same crazy ideas, when they're tested by lots of other people, when they're false, we never hear about it. So you as a reader might say, wow, there's 500 studies showing that this blood pressure medicine worked. That's great evidence that I should take it. 
really what you're missing is the population of when thousands and thousands of other people didn't find that it worked, they didn't feel like they were going to spend the time to tell you that. And you see this in the literature where when you look right at 0.05, there's way more p-values across lots and lots of papers that are below this 0.05 threshold. And as soon as you get above that, people are much less likely to publish their results. So as a whole, even if we're all individually honest, that kind of laziness or taste for kind of interesting results or crazy ideas that are proven right instead of wrong means that collectively um, we kind of render dishonest answers. So this is all kind of troubling. These are at least some of the reasons. We don't have a good sense of um, how widespread all these different practices are or to what extent each of them contributes to the kind of um, lack of re re um, replicability of the literature in general. But um, all of them probably do to, to some extent. So there's a lot of efforts right now, um, and over the last 10 years especially, a lot of people have been thinking about what are ways in which we can try to kind of combat this. Um, and I'm going to just briefly mention a few ideas out there. Um, so one, this is one of the older ideas, is the idea of making replication data available. So if you think about those studies where I showed people five different stories, asked them if they liked it, they were persuaded, and I just reported, well, when you compare this one story to this other story on this one, you know, that selective reporting, if you have to post all your data, people could hypothetically go back to it and say, wait a minute, what about all these other conditions? Or alternatively, wait, you said the blood pressure medicine worked for men under 30, but when I look at your whole data file, I see it didn't work for anybody else. So the things that you might not want to mention in your journal article, let's say, if you have to post your whole replication data file, um, now all of a sudden, kind of a, another person, kind of that, you're opened up to that transparency. Another thing um, that, um, another idea that's out there, um, the federal government actually recently um, instituted this, this idea of a, a registry of all studies. So the idea is, before I even start my blood pressure study, one of my um, 10,000 blood pressure studies across the country that we imagined, I have to actually go to the government and say, um, hey, by the way, I'm starting to do this study of this blood pressure medicine. And if I ever want to get it published, or if I'm a drug company, get my drug approved, I have to show that before I even started the study that I did that. And that's a great idea because that means when the 500 people go to the government and say, hey, I have this study showing that blood pressure medicine works, the government says, OK, well, before I recommend that people take this pill, I want to go look in the registry and say, how many other people tested this hypothesis I never heard from? And there's a lot of them. Let's go like, call them up and say, well, what did you find? How come we never heard from you and, and see what the truth is? Another idea is um, what's called a pre-analysis plan. So just like there was that example of the um, proposal made to the granting agency, people, there's a new norm that people should, before they do an experiment, actually say, here's the group that I'm going to compare. Here's the hypothesis that I'm testing. And that way, kind of guard against the perception that, oh, after the fact, you just picked, um, you just picked on the basis of which results looked best. You can say, no, in advance, this is what I meant. Um, and that way, it's much, le much less likely that whatever significant result you're showing me um, is just the result of looking for lots and lots and lots of, of uh, potential chance effects. And what I want to kind of talk about today, though, is the idea um, that, that this transparency is really good, um, but it's only half of the puzzle. Um, it is, it is kind of a necessary condition that we are able to understand more about the process behind published research to, so that like kind of mistakes, be they innocent or not so innocent, can be detected. Um, but if the replication data for a paper, let's say, is posted, that means the mistakes or fraud or whatever else could be detected, but just the fact that it's out there in public doesn't actually do the detecting. Um, somebody actually has to go do that. And so um, what I'm going to talk about is kind of a personal story uh, related to this. Um, it's made me uh, come up with some ideas for some new ways in which we could not just basically take all the transparent material that's out there and make sure that people are actually using it, kind of auditing the public record, and uh, sorry, the research record, and seeing, OK, the studies that are out there, um, can we actually believe them? And to do that, I'm going to talk about a personal story, that, um, a run-in that I um, had, or I think the lawyers told me I need to say, in my professional opinion, um, that I ran into um, the, uh, the last thing uh, in this, in this uh, pyramid, which is, which is falsification of data. So um, about two or three years ago, um, the, or actually, let me start earlier. Um, those of you who were here in California, um, November 2008, there was this Proposition 8, which is a proposition banning gay marriage um, in California that passed, much to the surprise of many people. Um, it was polling um, like it was going to be defeated, but instead the kind of populace voted in this kind of anti-gay way. Um, and the Los Angeles LGBT Center, this nonprofit organization in Los Angeles, where Prop 8 actually passed to their surprise in liberal LA County, said, we really want to understand why it is that people are kind of voting against us. And so they started sending people door to door, having conversations in kind of liberal neighborhoods that nevertheless voted for Prop 8 to say, 
know, why did you vote for Prop 8? And going door to door, having conversations with people. And they started to develop a pr an approach that they thought was effective um, at reducing people's prejudice towards gay people and making them more open um, towards gay marriage um, with the idea that this might be on the ballot again. These you know, people they were talking to might have gay relatives or gay friends, trying to reduce kind of the prejudice that they thought was animating um, this vote. Uh, and they did something, not just that, was really a unique thing in politics. They did something that's even more unique among people working in politics, which is they said, well, we have what we think is a good idea about how to accomplish something, but we want to know, is it actually a good idea, um, or is this just a bad, crazy idea? And so they contacted academics and said, we want to have this Thing that we, this thing we've developed, this kind of conversation where ultimately what they got to is asking people about kind of the marriages that they had or the love in their life and trying to get them to see how kind of gay people felt the same way about the marriages they wanted to have. They wanted to see, is this the kind of thing um, that, is, that actually works? And so they worked with a researcher in their neighborhood. Um, his name was Mike LaCour. He was a graduate student at UCLA, um, just down the road from um, their headquarters. And he did an experiment where, just like with the blood pressure medicine, instead of giving you the blood pressure medicine and you the sugar pill, he sent canvassers, he had the canvassers for the Los Angeles LGBT Center go door to door and deliver the blood pressure medicine, so to speak, that is, have the conversation the LA LGBT Center had developed, or instead have an unrelated conversation about recycling. So these, these uh, canvassers are going door to door, and now we have a treatment group random, randomly assigned that sort of identical at the beginning, but now one group has this kind of treatment of the conversation, one group has the control group of, we know they, the same kind of people, they can op they'll open the door of their home on a Saturday morning, but we're not gonna kind of give them this treatment. And then he went back, allegedly, um, and surveyed these people to say, okay, well, what do you think about gay marriage now? Um, and the results of this were reported in science, and they're really interesting, um, and I'm not gonna go into them too much, but the kind of banner finding uh, was that a conversation with a gay person um, increased support for um, gay marriage very, very dramatically. Um, and moreover, um, that this effect lasted. So social science is full of apparent effects on people's attitudes towards people and groups and issues. But almost always what we find is that if you say read some persuasive text today and you say, oh, I, that really convinces me, you totally forget about that by the next day. Um, effects on attitudes decay very rapidly. What was unique about this is something about conversations with a gay canvasser specifically were memorable, it seemed like forever. So a year later, the people who got that conversation were more supportive of gay marriage than the people who had the recycling conversation. So um, this is a really cool study, um, and it kind of overturned um, a lot of uh, kind of what I had always believed and what kind of we, as being graduate students in social science, always learn that you can't really change people's attitudes with kind of a 10-minute conversation about something like this. And so I said, something really special is going on here, and I want to really understand why. Um, and so I sort of started working on a follow-up study, and the, um, because of some other work that I had done, this group got in contact with me, um, and they wanted to do a follow-up study on some of their work about views towards transgender people. Uh, with uh, gay marriage legal, they said, well, now the next frontier is the T in LGBT. And so we started planning a study. Uh, and in the course of this, um, I wanted to look back at the original study to say, well, I need to kind of plan some things about how the study is going to go. I need to know how much uh, precision to expect, what the response rates will be. And in the course of looking through this data, this replication data that is required to be posted, um, I found some things that were pretty weird. So here's one example of, I think, the first thing that I found. So there is this one measure in the study called a feeling thermometer. And what a feeling thermometer is, is I ask you, imagine there's this thing called the feeling thermometer. And it goes from zero, which means very cold, to 100, which means very warm, and 50, which means like lukewarm and you know, in the middle. And I want to ask you, on that scale, how do you feel about gay people? And this is a notoriously terrible survey question because it doesn't mean anything. Um, and so what you find is that when you ask people these questions, if you ask the per same person the same question on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, they like give you a totally different answer every day because they have no idea how to take this thing, which is this kind of vague feeling they have about gay people, and map it onto this 0 to 100 scale. People are bad with numbers, and they're even worse at translating their feelings into, into numbers. And so I knew going in, okay, this is the kind of item that's going to be really bad. You're going to see a lot of people. And you also see on surveys total jokers all the time. People say 100 one day, zero the next. Um, and there's all these kind of ways in which survey data are kind of crap that I'm used to seeing. Uh, never, but what you actually saw is when you look at the people in the study, um, when you look at what people said when they were interviewed one week and then when they were interviewed only a few days later, 
uh, people's responses were very, very stable. Um, and across something like 10,000 people in, who were supposedly in this study, nobody did those joker things that I know people do on surveys, where they give a really different answer. And so at the time, I sort of thought, OK, well, um, this is pretty weird. Uh, and I sort of started thinking about this and was like, OK, I might have stumbled at this paper. Almost no, nothing from political science ever gets published in this journal Science, which is like the most prestigious academic journal, which this paper was. Um, not only was it really prestigious in my field and changed my thinking a lot, it was influencing what real world people do. There was a referendum coming up in Ireland where um, they were trying to use this study to try to convince people to vote for this referendum and make it such that there was um, full marriage equality in Ireland. Um, there were also lots of other groups that were trying to adapt this technique in door to door. I'll give you an example. Climate groups were thinking, OK, one of, the, one of the findings of the study was it has to be a gay person to have this long-lasting effect. It can't be a straight person. So they were thinking, well, what kind of messengers can we use? Do we need to get people from like low-lying areas whose houses are going to be underwater to go talk to people in the rest of town and say, hey, remember me. Like When you think climate change, think of me, the person whose house is going to be underwater. This, this study spawned lots and lots of um, Lots and lots of um, different people thinking. Even this morning um, on the train, I got an email from somebody that said um, an animal rights group that was thinking about sort of using this um, uh, before what happened happened. And so I realized this is not just the kind of thing where intellectually it's important to get this right. There's like thousands of people around the world who are actually trying to use this thing. Um, and I might know something like really relevant to the thing they're spending their time on. So um, what does one uh, do in such situations? Um, so. What I did uh, is talking to um, say, okay, I'm a grad student. I have this like suspicion. I'm not really sure about it. You know, I think I know how survey data is supposed to look. So I talked to a bunch of senior colleagues in my field. We had conferences. I would give talks at other universities, and I would say, hey, I found these patterns. Like, what do you think that what do you think that I should do? And what I heard from basically everyone um, was very surprising to me. Um, and what they told me is that I should do nothing. They said. Just move past it and pretend that you never saw this. Because it's not a clear case. You sort of have these suspicions. You have better things to do, which I just felt like was really not responsible. And what they told me is, well, look, whenever you criticize the published record in this way, you know, there's a lot of papers criticizing other pa papers. And if you have sort of a new theory or a new explanation, you can show, hey, look at how smart I am. I have this new theory for this paper out there. That's a really respected, normal thing in kind of ad academia. We have these adversarial interactions. But it's kind of really different when what you're doing or a critique you have kind of borders into this territory that this critique definitely would, we are sort of not just criticizing the, the theory and the, the deep facts or whatever it is of the research, but ultimately you're sort of criticizing some behavior on the part of the researcher. And they said is, well, look, some people, this person was on the academic job market at the same time as me. We weren't looking at any of the same jobs. But some people said, well, if you have this person at the same level as you and you kind of criticize them in this way, it's going to look like you're kind of throwing elbows. So you don't want to have that perception about you, kind of stay, stay away from it. Other people said, you know, here's the successful person, sorry, here's this person who's a grad student. You know, nobody likes it when you pick on grad students. And so uh, what a tenured faculty member might be told, for example, is, hey, lay off. He's a grad student. You know, don't, don't pick on this poor defenseless person. On the other hand, people said to me, they'll also say about people that are more senior in academia. They say, you know, if you do this, it's just going to look like you want attention for yourself. Here's this big study in science, and you come along wanting part of the action, don't you? And so everyone said, you know, if you do this, um, this is going to have big negative ramifications for you, no matter how you think about it. And they also said, what if you're wrong? And this was really the thing that weighed on my mind even more. I had this evidence that I sort of was worried about, but I wasn't really sure. And the last thing you want to do is tarnish someone's reputation or ruin their career um, when they're kind of a promising, smart person who I knew personally, um, if you're wrong. So um, I sort of wasn't sure what to do about this. This is the kind of thing I like talked about, but not that actively. I had a lot of other things to do. It was in the back of my mind. Um, but eventually, it came time for us to actually do um, the follow-up study. And when we were trying to do it, uh, one thing that happened is we were having difficulty kind of following, sort of getting as many people to do the surveys as, as, as he did in the original study. So I said, well, he had this vendor 
Um, you're not supposed to be able to read the email, so don't worry about it. He, he had this vendor that he used to allegedly um, recruit people to these surveys. So why don't I go talk to this vendor and ask the vendor, hey, um, can you do what you did for me for him? And I had this email that was forwarded for me um, from a few people where he said, hey, here's what the vendor is going to do. And so I called up this vendor. I say, hey, there's this person, Jason Peterson, your vice president of sampling and panel recruitment. Um, can I talk to this person? Because he did this big study for UCLA. I'd like to do it too. You know, whatever it is UCLA bought, that, that's what I need. Um, and they all said, you know, we're a really small company, and no person with that name has ever worked here. That person does not exist. Um, and then, and we definitely don't offer any of the services like the ones described in this email. So I was like, okay, um, now in combination with what I saw before, now all of a sudden I'm like a lot more worried than before. Um, and ultimately what happened is that um, I kind of went back to the data with um, Josh Callow, my co-author, and then the help of uh, Peter Arano, who's a professor at Yale, and we spent some time thinking about it and looking at it, not with this kind of like, is this weird, but really saying, okay, we need to stress test this data now, really look at it. What we eventually, after lots of twists and turns, realized is you could download a publicly available data set from a national survey, run like two lines of code, and basically reproduce exactly the data set that allegedly um, created this paper. So we saw that basically we could simulate data that looked exactly like um, the posted data um, in the paper um, a little too easily. Um, and eventually, and sort of, we sort of said, OK, now um, we're pretty convinced there's something here. Um, then, and one of the reasons why I'm so excited to talk to you all today and hear your thoughts on this um, is um, we, uh, uh, I, I was sort of like, what do I do next? Um, and my roommate, actually, uh, was the one who gave me the idea for how I should think about this. He is the product of the um, University of Washington Computer Science Department, um, CTO of a company called HashiCorp. And he said, you know, we have this idea in computer science called responsible disclosure. And the idea is that if you say, find out a way to hack Google, you don't just post that publicly. You send a private email to Google and you say, hey, before I like, say that I found this bug publicly, I want to give you some time to fix it. I want to give you advance notice. And that way, kind of vulnerability can't be exploited, so to speak. And then, after the fact, you're kind of transparent, and you say, after the bug is fixed, Google says, hey, this person found the bug, and here's this email chain we had. Here's how it all went down, just so everybody knows. And so he said, and he gave me some ideas about how we could follow those same principles here. So what we did is we said, OK, the vulnerability, our knowledge that we figured this out. We realized that you know, we had asked a lot of these kinds of questions of, um, of Michael before. We realized, OK, now that we really, really know, um, we can't just go to him and say, hey, we know you made up the data. Because we knew that there were lots of things he could do. He was just going to keep making other things up. We knew we really had to figure out the truth. And so we had his um, graduate advisor basically sit him down on Monday morning um, and say, OK, you did this big thing. You supposedly got a million dollars in grants, 10,000 know, know, survey responses, blah, blah, blah. Do you have like one receipt or like piece of paper or piece of data or email or anything from anybody, any kind of paper record of any kind indicating any of this ever occurred? Um, and basically, um, the answer was no. Um, and then to try to be transparent about it, after um, the senior author on the paper realized that the data was probably fabricated, and sent in a retraction, we sort of came forward and say, hey, this all just happened, and we want to be transparent about the fact that we had a role in it, we had suspicions for a while, and sort of here's what we found. So um, there was this retraction letter sent in um, by the co-author of, um, of the paper, um, and then we posted this, uh, uh, this on my website. We called irregularities um, in, the, in the data set we found. It then blew up all over the media. It was kind of a crazy thing. Um, and, um, one of the most salient takeaways from all of this media insanity that happened um, is, is that to this day, I have fellow researchers come up to me all the time or email me all the time and say, um, not, oh, it was so nice you did that or you shouldn't have done that or whatever. The most common thing I hear is, hey, me too. I have this paper I've always thought there was this big issue with, but I haven't known what to do about it. Um, and this is what social scientists call pluralistic ignorance. When everyone hopes that other people do something and thinks it should be OK to do something, but expects that, they sh that people wouldn't like it if they do it themselves. So everyone thinks, it would be nice. I, I would like it if other people told me the mistakes they saw in the published record, but they expect that everyone else would judge them negatively for it. So people are wrong about what other people think. And um, this is so pervasive that there's actually this website, Psych File Drawer, where people are supposed to post these replications, where if I replicate a paper and find it doesn't work, I'm supposed to say, hey, I did this just so you guys know. They're having these issues where people don't even want to say, I did the same study and I didn't find the effect. People are, are, are sort of don't want to admit to doing that. So there's this environment in academia right now where people don't want to come forward. 
So I think this is bad. And it puts us in the kind of top um, circle of these nine circles of hell, um, which the author calls a limbo. And this is those of us who, at any given time, are not committing um, one of the um, sins below, but are watching it all and not doing anything about it. And so there's a lot of us there. And um, what I've learned is a lot of people are there and don't want to be there. And, and that's because this status quo means that you know, researchers make mistakes, innocent or not, and we kind of maybe talk about it at conferences. And there's kind of this folk wisdom about the papers that kind of everybody knows are wrong or that nobody knows are wrong that they should know are wrong. Authors can't respond to it. We can't really look into this. And the public doesn't really know. So all the people that fund our research, fund these buildings, they never actually know what we know about what research can be believed and not. Um, so what I think is academia might actually need some form of what you might call responsible disclosure. The idea here being some way of legitim legitimizing a process. Um, I don't know if it would have worked in my particular case, but in many of the cases that I hear about, legitimize a process that would allow people to say, I have this concern about this published study. For example, I think that they didn't report everything. And I want to look into that. And to do that, we can't just like exhort people. If there's one thing we know from social science, and probably convinced you we don't actually know all that much. But one thing we do know is you can't just tell people, hey, you should behave this way, and then hope they do. That will not work. So we have to like acknowledge some things that we wish were not true and just say, OK, this is the way the world is. The way the world is is criticizing peers is uncomfortable. Um, reputation is the currency of academia. People want to look like good researchers. Um, some important criticisms don't really help that reputation. They're not deep. They're just, hey, I might have found this error. Um, so people need some kind of other incentive to act. And understanding somebody else's data is not straightforward. So it's not so easy as saying, hey, I found this error. I, I want to post it publicly. Sometimes you often need to do some communication. So the idea I have is for a kind of communication system where you could imagine people who find issues in published research or think they found issues can talk to the authors and try to figure out, um, OK, are, is there an issue in this study? And here's what I have in mind. Imagine that you read a paper and you say, you know, I worry that I, I look, or you say, I downloaded the replication data, and there's these other outcomes that they don't discuss in the paper that make the results look less good. And so I'm sort of worried that maybe the results are not as strong as the published record indicates, and that the public would think if, if they read it. What you could do is send an email to the author through this system. They would say, hey, a person, anonymous at the beginning of the conversation, a person has a question for you. And you could sort of communicate back and forth in a way that is confidential. So the conversation, just like in the bug bounty case, is not being public. Um, you're talking privately. But the identity of the critic is shielded. So that way, if in the worst possible case, there's no way the critic, the author could kind of exert retribution. We have no idea who the critic is. Um, then two things can happen. Either the critic could say, OK, now, back and forth, you're hemming and hawing. I think I've actually found something. I'm at the point now where I'm willing to go public and say, here's this conversation that now is going to be retroactively public. Everybody could read. And I'm willing to attach my name to it and say, I think I found this issue. Everybody, I think it's, you know, if you're interested in this paper, it's worthwhile to read this email exchange we had and that this third party can verify we had. The author can also say, this is malarkey. I'm tired of being harassed by this person, whatever else. Can't forcibly reveal the identity of the critic, but can decide, whoever you are, whatever issue you have, I think I've answered this. I think people should know we had this email exchange. It's public. Or some people have said um, they don't want to be anonymous. You could also say, hey, here's who I am, by the way, uh, if you wanted. So the idea here uh, is that what the technology would do um, is provide a third party that could verify that a conversation happened, um, while also shielding the identity of, of the critic unless the critic wants it to be open, but then verify that it, in fact, was that person. That means that we have no anonymous public criticism. That means that we can figure out the details before going public. So you can actually say, hey, what about this? What about that? And kind of get the facts that you often need to get in these cases. Or the authors can also own up and say, oh yeah, you're right, which I think a lot of people would do. Helps protect critics from retribution. That way, you're not that person who the tenured professor will always know that you're questioning their studies and try to block you from getting jobs or whatever else. Um, and also, there's kind of a bug bounty here. If you actually find an issue, and then someone can say, oh, here's the kind of person we should kind of accrue some reputational rewards to this person. It was really good that they were careful and went through the published record, found this issue, and let us all know about it. And we can now attach that to your name and kind of give you um, th those rewards. Yeah. So just to clarify, I can't, other than what you're proposing, mm -hmm. I can't go public with the flaw but remain anonymous. Exactly. So um, there's no cell in which, um, uh, in which basically the critic could decide to make anonymous public criticism. Only the author could decide, OK, 
basically the, the critic knows that the author can't forcibly reveal their identity. So if I email you an issue with your paper, you can't say, who is this, and, like, and shame me, or whatever else. But you could decide, OK, I think this is a meritless accusation. Or you could even decide, oh, um, you know, I think this is, uh, you know, many people might have this question about my paper, but I think it checks out. So I'm willing to, you know, have this out there so people know. Um, but that's the idea, yes. The, the author can never kind of forcibly reveal the critic, um, but the critic can't just anonymously publicly say, um, here, here are these issues. That's the idea. And the goals here are to sort of increase the incentives for reporting flaws. Um, there's probably some optimal level of how much of this there goes on. We don't want every paper dealing with this all day, every day. But I would say probably based on the fact that the majority of what we do is not true means that we're not doing enough of this right now. So I think we need more incentives for doing that. Um, on the other hand, we want to protect innocent researchers from kind of incorrect or um, anonymous accusations. And then also increase the public accessibility um, of this knowledge. So it's not just the kind of thing where you get to graduate school, and as I did, you hear in your first year seminars, oh, everybody knows that paper doesn't actually work. Uh, this is actually something that those who don't attend elite graduate programs could know about. And, and the idea for kind of the indirect effect is if you're an author thinking of doing one of these things, you're going to say, oh, man, that system's out there and might catch me one day. Um, and it also kind of increases the value of those transparency tools. So now all of a sudden, all that replication data that's been posted, that people have gone through the effort to post, becomes a lot more valuable um, if we know that there's a system for actually um, vetting it. So um, we're in Silicon Valley, obviously. So um, every, uh, every uh, idea needs to be solved by um, a beta piece of software. Um, and so obviously, that's what it here, um, here it is that I'm here to do, um, is not just to get your comments that I'm really interested in, um, but uh, also um, try to uh, solicit your help in building this. Uh, so this is something where when I talk to a lot of people in social science, they say, here's papers one, two, three, four, five, that, like I need this for. Um, I need some way to do this, and this would provide me kind of an institution, a legitimized way to express the concerns that I have. So there's a lot of demand out there for something like this right now. Um, I'm sure that the ideas I have are not perfect, and you all have a lot more experience thinking about um, how it is that people kind of interact with systems like this, the incentives there. So I'm very interested to hear your comments. Um, but you also have the expertise to actually think about how to build something like this. And so part of what I'm here to say is that um, if you're interested in that, you should come talk to me about it. Because um, we have money and are ready to actually pay somebody to build this thing. And the idea would be to beta test it. To basically um, uh, start with a class, start with a couple classes, and say, let's work out the kinks. Let's see if this is a, actually a terrible idea. Let's see if it's abused. Let's see what happens um, if this actually produces useful results or not. Um, and that's where we kind of want to start. So part of why I'm here today is to get your comments, and part of it is to recruit you. Um, so uh, uh, that's where we are. And I'm sure there's lots of uh, questions. Yes. The author to participate in this, right? Isn't it like they like I published it, want to move on, and I can just safely ignore? It yeah. Yeah. So I think the um, the idea would be that if you're the author, what you know. So so here here'd be the idea. Suppose that you're a dishonest author and you get one of these emails saying, "Hey, this anonymous person says they looked at your data set and they feel like your findings are not actually all that robust." One thing you could do is say, "All right, I'm just going to not respond." Um, I think then the idea is what the critic could do is say, hey, will you respond? Hey, will you respond? And eventually say, OK, it's been six months since I originally wrote to you. You haven't responded. At this point, I'm going to basically take your silence as an admission of guilt or something like that. And the critic could basically say, even if the author doesn't agree, the critic has the option in the second row of saying, look, I'm pushing this conversation public. This is at the point where I feel like other people should know you're not responding to this. And so knowing that that might happen, the idea is that the author would say, well, I don't want to be kind of shown as one of these people who like, never responds to questions about their research, so I'm going to respond. Yes, but if you're the honest author, right? Um, oftentimes, like, honest authors will also like, not like, respond because just like a large amount of emails. Yes, totally. It's, 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 a, uh, it's, a, it's an overhead, right? Yeah, that's right. Give them any benefit. Right. Therefore, if it's like kind of the norm that like person not respond well, yeah. but, like right, if, if it's like the normal like, like by volunteering to participate in the system, I have pledged myself that every email I ever get right. I will respond to promptly. Well, I think that's like, yeah. I, I would never want to do that. That's right. Well I think that's kind of the idea because um, 
uh, hopefully this is the kind of thing where you don't get to decide. You know, um, If you say, oh, I'm just never going to check my email inbox again, then eventually if people are doing this to you, then all of your colleagues are going to say, it's mighty weird that so-and-so has all these people that have been trying to email him about issues in his studies, and he or she never wrote back to any of them. Um, so that's the idea, is it kind of uses the fact that in academia there's this like social pressure um, to kind of defend your work and comply with norms and be honest to say, OK, everybody else is going to watch the fact that I'm not responding and kind of judge me negatively. That's going to kind of compel me to do it. So the idea is to kind of leverage that, um, leverage that kind of social pressure that, that would happen. Um, there is then the question of like the false positive of you know, what if someone, like there are in fact many academics um, who are just so busy. And so I think one thing you could do, for example, like imagine if like, so I'm um, you know, going this weekend up to Point Reyes, then I'm flying to Denver on Monday. If someone said, you know, I want an answer immediately, I think I would just respond on the system and say like, I'm busy. The question you have is going to take me some time to look into. You know, it's a good question or not. You know, give me a couple months. And I think this is the kind of thing where as the kind of administrators of the system, we don't have to kind of decide what the norm should be. Um, I think leave it in the hands of people to say, you know, if all of a sudden some critic says, that's not good enough, you know, screw you, David, like you didn't respond in 24 hours with a full data file, um, then I think I would say, you know, I'm pretty sure anybody reading this is going to think that I acted reasonably. And like, here's why. And, you know, give me a few weeks. Um, so I think the idea is to say, you know, all this is is kind of the very, very like basic kind of tools of kind of an audited conversation and the option for, you know, private anonymity. Um, and then you know, the social norms can kind of build around that where people can figure out, um, okay, well, what's, what is kind of a reasonable use of, use of this or, or, or not? Be the hope. Yeah. So one thing to, that I often think about when I'm designing a social system is the, the deleterious effect of an antisocial behavior mm -hmm. relative to the positive effect of a pro-social behavior. Yeah. So Wikipedia works because it's far faster to revert bad changes than mm -hmm. it is to generate bad changes, yeah. for example. And there was a there's a really wonderful, well, terrible example, depending on your point of view, at UC San Diego where they were trying to crowdsource some like reassembly of a shredded document mm -hmm. and a group would they came in and they basically just moved everything around and you know it, it totally nuked the the effect because it was much easier to mess it up than it was to reassemble it. Mm -hmm. So what I'm thinking about here is how much harm a single individual could have on sort of the socio-technical system. Yeah. Uh, and whether there are ways to mitigate that. So, for so for, imagine for a minute that like Geza publishes papers, and I'm just a troll, yeah. and I'm just basically pff, sort of picking off right. like, papers and, and throwing basically meritless accusations at right. it, but ones that are essentially causing a lot of effort to be spent on behalf of the authors. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering if there are ways in the system to shadow ban or hell ban or something these people yeah, that would essentially reduce that incentive to uh, troll people. Yeah, good question. So a few ideas I've had on that front, and I'm sure you have many more. So one is um, that I think to use this, um, you'd probably want to have something where there's an indication of like somebody's email address is like .edu or not. Not that like valid criticism can't come from not .edu domains, but that would kind of give you some signal. Um, another would be that um, people could, you know, there'd probably be some like report option. And I think also authors could say, you know, this is the 10th one of these I've gotten from somebody this week. Um, you know, I think this is harassment. You know, if I hear from somebody else, I'm happy to do this, but you know, here's my judgment of the situation. So I think to some extent you could allow authors to sort of call it out. Um, because part of what I'm thinking about is like ways to create as little overhead as possible so that there's not like some body that has to decide if this is, is happening, but you know, some extent of that's always um, going to be unavoidable. Um, for me to make many different accounts, yeah, yeah, and then basically be, right. pretend to be a, a new right. graduate student, right, right. And another, yeah, another, another idea of being a kind of social science, you know, sitting with a lot of economists would be make people pay five dollars. Just say, hey, that's not that much, but um, if you want to do, you know, is it really worth a thousand dollars to you to like be a troll? Then yeah, those kind of small costs can deter people, maybe. Yeah. Yes. In the bad case for an incorrect paper, would you expect? the author to then uh, go back and fix, like try to do the study again, and if so, where would they secure the funding for that? Or yeah, that's a great question. So um, it really depends on the, uh, the kind of study. So um, like a lot of the work that I do, for example, is really cheap. Um, so I don't need to go get grants for it. I'm doing you know, super cheap surveys, collecting existing data, 
working with groups that are already paying for something, um, whatever else. In other, in other cases, um, you know, research is really expensive. So um, I think the idea would be um, a few things. One is, um, obviously, there is like some level of like embarrassment that occurs. Um, and I think, like, why is that like a good thing? Uh, partly is because it's not just about like what happens in this, you know, that you can observe, but it's like the effect that people know this might be coming. So in some sense, part of the hope of like the biggest effect will not actually be what happens that you can directly observe in such a system, but rather what a researcher who knows this system exists will do. So the idea is, okay, I know that I might be embarrassed if I don't like follow like some honest procedures or I'm not careful, so now I should like not do the things that will lead that to happen. So I would say that's actually goal number one, just the kind of reaction, um, the kind of anticipated reaction to that. Uh, we would call an equilibrium effect in, in social science. Um, I think in terms of what would happen in a particular case, um, there's a lot of things that could happen. One thing that could be, um, depending on the, the severity of the error, papers can be kind of, there's this thing called corrigendum, what do you, I never know how to pronounce it, where you can sort of say, uh, okay, you know, this table was wrong, or papers can be retracted, people can you know, submit amendments. There's lots and lots of ways in which kind of journals deal with this um, that, that, that one could imagine. Um, and depending on the kind of study, hopefully other people would, would, would do it again. So, and you could imagine the kind of thing where on a given paper, uh, once it's kind of public that there's some issue about it um, and the kind of thread has been made public, I thought about maybe other people could then go comment and say, oh, well, I saw this thread and then did a replication and like, here's what I found. And you could also use ratings, just as bug bounty. So somebody with negative ratings just get shut down from your system. If somebody writes you a bogus email, you... I mean, yeah, it's as long as, with multiple emails. As long as identities are, have some expense, whether social or financial. Yeah, right. If identities are cheap, then that doesn't work. Right? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Uh, OK, I don't know how to put a column. You, I, OK, one, okay. The floor is yours. All right, uh, yes. Um, this might be kind of a stupid question, but in terms of like intellectual property, say I like say that, oh, I see an error in your paper, and I think you should have done it this way. And you're like, oh, okay, I see that, and you do do it that way. Mm -hmm. Like, would you have to put my name? Like, would I be given credit in some way, or like, what actually yeah. happens there? I think all the time. I mean, we already have like a, a very prominent way in which this happens in academia, which is anonymous peer review. Uh, when people uh, if you submit a paper for publication, um, in many cases, though not all cases, the reviewers don't know who you are. But also, almost always, when you get the reviews back that say this should or should not be published, you don't know who the reviewers are. So we already kind of recognize in academia and deal with this problem of sometimes people have ideas that you don't know who they are. And typically what people will do is like footnote, like I acknowledge an anonymous reviewer for you know, giving me this idea or, or something like that. Um, one thing, that, it is a good question though, and, and one thing it does make me worry about is um, you know, to what extent would people kind of censor themselves because you know, they want to get credit for some idea. But I guess my view is, uh, in that case, they can, that kind of person who feels like they have some kind of publishable idea, that it kind of rises to the level of like it's a, there is kind of real intellectual property there, that kind of idea already has a way of being expressed in academia, which is like you go publish it. Whereas what I'm more worried about is these kind of smaller issues where it's not a, you know, a big intellectual contribution of the size that clears the bar for like a journal article to say this paper wasn't honest. Um, but you still want some way of incentivizing people to make that known. Yeah, yeah? Another big problem with academic integrity is that retracted papers continue to be cited yes. as if they hadn't been retracted. Yes. Could you extend your system to also solve that problem? Um, wow, that's a good question. Um, it is true, and it's amazing and crazy. Um, I, don't, I don't know, do you have any ideas on top about that? or? Well, I, I guess a big part of it is like media and communications, mm -hmm. and I'm not an expert on that kind of thing, but um, it, it's hard to track down whether or not the paper has been retracted yeah. or not, and so when you glance over it, it makes your paper look much more credible, and you don't, so I don't know, uh, but it could involve some kind of communicating that it has been retracted better. Yeah, so the, the kind of phenomenon that, that he's referring to is that oftentimes you'll see, you know, someone will write in their academic paper, well, you know, building on, you know, if assuming X is true, where X is something that has been learned to be not true, and then you build some other claim from that. Um, and, and, and a lot of that happens, weirdly. Uh, so um, I think the, uh, uh, I, I don't know how to solve that problem, other than like the very boring thing of like journals need to update their websites better or their PDFs or something. Uh, but um, in terms of like, what is the theory of like how people would happen upon this information? I think the goal would be that 
like oftentimes in, in, in these situations, like, okay, so in, in the case of the, um, the liqueur thing, um, literally I just, I didn't like announce this to anybody. Like we had had this thing, the, the retraction was sent into science and we were like, we just wanna be transparent about our involvement in this. I, I literally just put a, a, like a small print link at the bottom of my website that like linked to this PDF document. And like then by the next day, I mean, I, I have no idea like how it got out in there because I didn't like advertise it. I just put it down there. And like by the next morning, it was like everywhere. Um, so, uh, which I means what I expected to happen to be clear. Um, but, but at the very least, I think there's like ways in which like people who care enough about something will like go talk about it and in the like kind of small communities of researchers that work in particular areas. Can you um, that big a common uh, form of accusations of dishonesty in this system is people saying, oh, you cited this thing that is, has, has been retracted. Yeah, it's important. You could imagine that if somebody, if like, you know, the interpretation of somebody's results is really built on some other, you know, more basic claim being true. You could imagine it being like another kind of, it's not error in data, but it's kind of error in reasoning or something like that. I have one further question. Yeah. Um, systems don't have to satisfy every use case. One that I feel like maybe you've made a conscious or a conscious decision to leave out is the uh, friends outing friends phenomenon. Mm. So let's say that you and I are friends, and uh, well, let's let's say that Geza and I are friends, and, and Geza uh, thinks that you know we're down has, has okay. seen uh, well. <laughs> I don't want to put you in a weird position. Um, and Geza uh, has seen evidence that he thinks I have been acting unethically about a paper. Yeah. Right. This is a scenario where if you follow this chart, what would end up happening is you know he says I you know. Well, I found this irregularity in your data because mm -hmm. it's there, because yeah. I knew about it, because I could sort of see what was going on, right? Then that goes public. Uh, the only way for him to make it go public is to also out himself to me. Yeah. Um, when we know that many of these, like in the history of people being outed, yeah, you know, right, like they're actually close to yeah, the yeah. That's a great question. I wonder how, like. Do we just set that aside, or are there other ways to deal with that? Yeah, so uh, a couple of thoughts that don't directly answer that. Um, you know, I think to some extent, academia it deals with that now a bit in the sense that um, you know, I at least half the papers I review, I know who they're by because I've seen them before, and they're like people that I know and like and would consider my friends. And that's just kind of an unavoidable part of it. And people feel like already, you know, there might be some bias there, but I think people are at least somewhat accustomed to the academia of like doing that. There is this level at which if it rises to a kind of more serious like honesty issue. Um, and I think the way I think about that is this, you know, if you go in, and, and this is why I actually think this is not a good, I, th this would not have helped like my particular case. It was just like what my case opened my, my eyes to. If there's something like really serious like that, or you know if your right is gonna be very serious, then I think probably, in this case we had this time pressure because this other study and this other people's money we were spending that we had to like know if this is right or not, and the public stuff and whatever. But I think in, a, in more typical cases what would happen is you would go through kind of the academic honesty channel. So you would imagine like, you know, one of you would go to like a dean and say this should be investigated, or you would kind of go through the you know, channels of the university and like our employers and or supervisors and kind of those channels would be the ones you would, you would probably prefer um, in, in many of those cases. Um, with that said, uh, I, I think one way in which that does make the real world version of that problem easier though, um, is you could easily imagine a situation where, for example, a lot of people um, don't post their replication data online, but they will email it out. And so right now we're in a situation where imagine um, you know, there's some author you want to write to, and there's some paper that you feel like that person only gets requests for the replication data maybe once a year and you think there might be an issue with the paper, if you write into that person and say, okay, well, you know, I wanna see your data, and then a few months later, magically, some person comes out of the ether saying, looking at your data, I have this concern, it's gonna be obvious it's you. So I think one extension to this that definitely is necessary is, I think it should become um, potentially a norm, if, if, if this in fact is a good idea, that you know, right from the beginning, even if you don't suspect anything's wrong, um, this is the mechanism by which you ask for replication data. So if um, it's, I'm just saying, hey, here's an anonymous email from a .edu address saying I want the replication data, not because I think there's anything wrong, but just because that way, in case I do find something, you can't say, aha, that's the only person that asked for my data, it was probably them. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 
So, uh, really, really interesting stuff. And I'm wondering, you know, in the previous studies that you showed earlier on, mm -hmm. it seems like this is, you know, a rampant problem, yeah. right? Uh, or, or at least, you know, fa fairly large, right? Yeah. And so I'm wondering, and, and the system you're proposing seems like it's really good at catching or creating some incentives to do this after it's been published. But as you, you know, mentioned, uh, uh, we have, in theory, a system uh, inside academia to try to catch problems yeah. ahead of time, peer review. And so I'm wondering, have you thought at all? And, and to me, uh, it seems like, you know, if the previous studies, you know, as indicated, it seems like we have a big problem with peer peer review, right? Yeah. And, you know, as a peer reviewer, I think, you know, we just get so many, there's so many papers, and as it seems like there's sort of this, uh, you know, arms race in academia to publish more and more, yeah. each paper, there's still not as many academics, mm -hmm. and we have this issue. And this is a lot, uh, you know, a topic that comes up a lot in program committee meetings and these things. How yeah. do we actually fix this problem of peer review in that, you know, you could have a reasonable amount of time and give each paper a really solid look. So I'm wondering if you've thought at all about, like, how do we make that better? Or is it just that we need to have some, you know, post hoc solution yeah. that can then use the wisdom of so many more people who are going to read the paper? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, many people way smarter than me have thought uh, for much longer than I have about um, how to make peer review better. Um, and you know, just because it's not a perfect system doesn't mean it's not you know, better than nothing, right? Um, so uh, I don't know that I have any, um, anything insightful to say off the top of my head about it. What I will say is that definitely thinking along those lines um, is what inspired the kind of fourth row of the table here. The idea being, if you're a peer reviewer, you know, why write a careful review? Um, really, you know, besides kind of the ethical duty to yourself, and this is kind of really academic inside baseball for those of you who don't live in this world, the only reason is, like, if you're writing a peer review, the people, the only person who reads it with your name attached to it is the editor of the journal. So if you write a totally stupid peer review or not a careful peer review, or, you know, on the other hand, if you're thinking about putting in the effort to write a really good peer review, the only person in whose eyes those reputational benefits accrue um, is, the, is the editor of that journal. So it's a kind of a pretty small payoff. So the idea here is part of the, the bug bounty here is, is, is this last row, um, which is to say, um, you know, as a peer reviewer, you, you just don't have the incentive to be careful. And I think it would be really hard to, um, to, to figure out a way to do that, to, to kind of incentivize anonymous peer reviewers to, 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 to be more careful. But um, when you're doing public criticism, um, or sorry, not the fourth row, the, the second row, um, if you're doing public criticism and you say, OK, well, hey, I think, and, and sort of we all agree, you know, being careful and reading a paper and seeing it has an issue and following up on it, that's like a good thing that means we should think more of you. If like that's a thing we all agree on in the context of this you know, legitimized thing, then um, all of a sudden somebody might feel like they have an incentive to go the extra mile. So, I mean, again, even though I don't think it's the best, um, the best example of this, um, you know, the, the, the data for this paper um, that looks like, th that looked like this, um, you know, this was data that a lot of people worked with. Okay, so, um, you know, there was, there was a couple of follow-up papers written on like methodological things in this data, whatever else. So a lot of people spent a lot of time with this data. This is part of why for me, I said so little, is I was like, a lot of other people looked at this data and they haven't, you know, decided to go forward. So, you know, why should I think that I know better than they do? This seems weird, but they're not concerned, what, you know. So um, I think one thing that, you know, that, you know, this shows you is that a lot of people can look at a lot of things and miss stuff. And really part of what it takes is, you know, lowering the activation energy so someone says like, hey, this seems weird, can you explain this? Um, so that it's a little easier to kind of get the chain of dominoes rolling. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time.